So now I'm going to get into a comparison of two corn samples that uh, Jim sent in. Um, and one of, these, uh, one of these fields has received um, manure um, that was treated with, I don't, I don't know if manure one is actually the same exact product, but yeah, essentially the, the manure one product. The other one, and for the past three years, since 2019, the other field has not received it, any uh, manure applications. Um, and there are some slight differences uh, historically in the land management and use of these fields. But uh, overall, they're fairly similar, and we get some interesting results here based on that one difference, the, the manure treatment. So here's just the summary section of the report, a little bit bigger so, and easier to see. Um, but we, looking at, at the colors here on the, on the summary, there's a lot of similarity. The, the soil quality section, pretty similar. Um, soil quality low, biodiversity high, functionality medium, resistance very low here. Um, low in the in the sparse field, the treated um, sample on the right. Um, on the untreated field, we did see both arbuscular uh, endo and ectomycorrhizae, and um, Jim pointed out that this field had been left fallow at some point um, back 10, 10, 15 years, and speculated that perhaps there was some population of um, those those endos that that managed to. Um, persist in the soil, but on the, on the treated field, we only saw those those ectomycorrhizal species. That fungi to bacteria ratio, one to one eighty three uh, versus one to one eighty, is a little bit more balanced on the treated side. And going down here, we do see some differences in some of the nutrient pathways that we'll get into in a bit more detail using those data analysis tools that I have some outputs of on the on the following slides. So this is uh, what we call our heat map tool. Um, and this shows the same sort of color-coded category, um, but this is just makes it a lot easier to compare reports side by side, especially if you have like 5, 10, 20 reports. Much easier to look at them here than shuffle between a bunch of PDFs. Um, and on the soil quality side, again, a lot of similarity, um, just that slight difference in resistance. Soil-borne disease risk, these fields, are, these fields are pretty close together, right? Um, and overall, most of the disease risk, the, the diseases that we saw were relatively similar. Um, we'll get into, now this is looking at risk, so this does take into account biocontrol agents, but we'll look at some interesting changes in the actual levels of those, some of these pathogenic species. The biocontrol agents was one area we saw some difference. The, treat, the manure treated field did have higher levels of insecticide and nematicide agents, as indicated here by that darker blue. And then on the phytohormones hormones and stress adaptation side, this is where we probably saw the most variability overall in a category. Um, the untreated field being in the medium range across many of these uh, phytohormones hormones and other metabolites, um, but exopolysaccharide and auxin higher in the treated, while gibberellin and cytokinin were lower. Um, and then uh, lower heavy metal solubilization and uh, sidurophores, um, similar levels of abscisic acid producing microbes. Um, the nutrient pathways, this is where we saw some interesting change in the phosphorus and potassium um, pathways, uh, which were improved in that treat, the field that did receive that uh, treated um, manure compared to the other sample. Looking a little bit higher resolution at, this, uh, at these biocontrol agents, this is looking at that 0 to 100 index, and we saw out of 100, a plus 27 score increase in the treated sample compared to the untreated. Um, so that's, that's you know, a pretty substantial increase. When you look at that as essentially a percentage, that's, you know, 27% is, is pretty dramatic. And a 21% difference um, in the insecticide agent levels. Now we can't, because there were some differences historically in the management of these fields and they aren't right next to each other, we can't say it, it was definitively the manure that drove these changes, but that was one of the major differences. Other than that, um, these had both um, been, uh, been treated or, or tilled using the curse buster for the last three years or so and, and had been under very similar management. So that was one of the major differences was the manure application and may have had an influence on these insecticidal and nematicidal species. Um, looking at these, these phytohormones, hormones, the one that really stood out um, on the stress adaptation metabolite side was these exopolysaccharides, which as I mentioned are involved in biofilm formation, essentially a glue that helps hold the soil together, helps with nutrient retention, helps um, with 
uh, moisture retention, and that was an 18 score increase in the treated sample compared to the untreated. I pulled some um, scientific papers here that, that talk a little bit about exopolysaccharides that were able to demonstrate um, that exopolysaccharides produced by um, plant growth promoting bacteria in, increase uh, the plant growth and, and drought tolerance and um, can enhance soil aggregation um, and uh, improve the retention of moisture and, and nutrient retention in the soil. So that's certainly a very, very important um, function and um, it's also just very interesting to kind of look at, you know, being a manure, that's something that's, that can potentially help with biofilm formation. So it may have selected four populations of microbes that are your exopolysaccharide producers. Improved root growth or other indirect responses of the manures may also have um, led to an increase in the levels of these exopolysaccharide producing microbes. Looking at the nutrient pathways, as I mentioned, P and K is where we really saw a difference. Um, the overall P and K pathways went up and looking at the supply pathways, um, inorganic phosphorus uh, solubilization and uh, potassium solubilization both went up nine points. These solubilization is for many microbes uh, do solubilize both P and K, not, not, they don't all solubilize P and K if they do one or the other. Um, but we saw similar numbers there in terms of an improvement in, in those solubilizer populations. And then we also saw a drop between the untreated and the treated in inorganic phosphorus consumption. And again, as I was saying, consumption isn't always a bad thing as those microbes that are consuming these nutrients might go through the rhizophagy cycle, they might help reduce leaching, but I just thought it was interesting to see a 13 point decrease there. If you are at the point in the season where plants are in, in demand of P and K, it may be beneficial to have lower levels of these phosphorus consumers in the soil so that there's more there available potentially to the plant. We can also look at levels of, um, of specific species or, uh, at, or genus in the soil. This is another um, tool in our online portal where you can look at path, this is two pathogen species populations. So we have septoria bacteria and that their population was much higher at a relative abundance of 1.22% up here in the untreated versus 0.12% uh, in the spars untreated sample. Fusarium oxysporum, um, which was much more prevalent in terms of its relative abundance in the, in the untreated versus the treated. Um, so again, we can look at pathogen levels and this can definitely inform, um, you know, regimens as far as fungicides and other, other treatment methods to assess risk level. Of course, these are going to be impacted by factors um, like weather and, and moisture levels too, um, but it can give us some information on what's out there, what we might have to treat, or what we might be able to avoid spending money on treating if it's not there at very high levels. We can also look at our beneficial microbe populations the same way. Um, here on the top we have uh, the relative abundance of a nematicidal fungi called Purpuriocilium lilacinum. Um, this is actually a nematophagous fungi, so it actually feeds on nematodes, and that was likely definitely one of the species that drove up that nematicide agent level we looked at um, with a relative abundance of 0.68% of the total microbiome in the treated sample versus 0.19% in the untreated. Um, the Pseudomonas, a heavily studied genus of plant growth promoting bacteria, was also higher at 0.37% uh, versus 0.13% in the untreated. Um, and of course, you know, Pseudomonas includes many different species, many, some of which are, are known to perform certain functions, um, some that are phytohormone producers, some that are nutrient solubilizers, but we could hone in and look at the individual species of Pseudomonas and compare their relative abundance as well. So um, now I just want to go over just a couple case studies that show um, just using some general anonymized data, how, how clients have used this data in the past to inform their management practices. In this particular case study, tissue tests indicate potassium deficiency across about half of the grower's blocks, despite high potassium levels in their soil fertility tests. And I think that this is an instance that we, we see fairly often um, with agronomists coming to us to identify um, what is leading to these deficiencies when they seem to have sufficient levels of a nutrient in their soil fertility tests. Um, they also suspect issues in phosphorus due to lack of yield response to phosphorus applications. And again, this is across about half of the growers' blocks. So they go ahead and pull, pull samples from each of their blocks, um, 10 blocks, 
And here we have that heat map tool comparing the levels of these um, biological pathways. And sure enough, across about half of their block, six out of 10 to be exact, a little bit more than half, we saw much uh, lower functioning phosphorus and potassium pathways as indicated by the yellow versus the blue throughout their other blocks. So we've identified the problem, um, you know, that's great. But then of course, the next question we get with biomakers is, well, what do we do? And we can look further again at the specific microbial species driving these changes and see, you know, what populations might be deficient when we compare these, these blocks that are, um, have very effective phosphorus and potassium cycling versus um, lower levels of those phosphorus and potassium cyclers. And that's where we can drill in and, and look at some of these species of plant growth promoting bacteria that we know are, you know, are heavily studied, are marketed a lot as biofertilizers and biostimulants, biologicals. And here we have blocks one through six on the top in the blue with uh, this bar and each of these little triangles is a sample. And then we have blocks seven through 10, 10 down here in the purple and Bacillus and Pseudomonas, two genera that are you know, heavily studied and known to include a lot of bacterial species that solubilize P and K. Sure enough, in blocks one through six, where we saw the lower functioning, their populations were lower in comparison to blocks seven through 10 that had higher functioning. That's not to say there weren't many other bacteria and fungal species that drive this change. Your mycorrhizae have been shown to play an important role in phosphorus release and uptake to the plant. But this is just one area that the grower might be able to go out and find an inoculant, a product, or an institute of management practice that can help support these populations of phosphorus and potassium solubilizers. So that's ultimately the um, conclusion or the solution that they might come to. In this uh, next case study, this is shifting and focusing on diseases. In this case, a grower has dealt with sporadic fusarium and verticillium diseases over the years. They typically put out a preventative fungicide across their, all their blocks, um, but due to high fungicide prices and wanting to reduce the potential harm to beneficial fungi, they hope to reduce fungicide applications and their goal is to determine which fields would be lowest risk. So again, they go out, they sample each of their fields and they're sampling three blocks, A, B, and C. We're looking at those levels of these, these pathogens and fusarium fairly broad uh, spread out levels across A and B, but fairly high levels in some of these samples taken on these blocks. Block C, much lower overall on average um, in terms of fusarium. And in terms of verticillium, same story, higher levels in blocks A and B. Block C, it only showed up in one sample. They actually pulled three samples from each block and there's only one point here. So in two of those samples, there weren't even any verticillium detected. So this tells us lower fungal pathogen levels in block C. And while the pathogen levels are important to how effective, how much damage you're gonna to see to a crop, there's also the natural biocontrol agents that can limit these diseases. So looking at that, blocks A and C have relatively high levels of these fungicidal um, microbes in the soil, but block B, um, which had high levels of the pathogens, is low. So what, what the uh, client might take into consideration and conclude looking at these results they may decide to not apply preventative fungicide in block C because it showed both low disease pressure and high levels of fungicidal microbes. Reduce the rate in block A because it did it had lower disease pressure, um, uh, but also um, high biocontrol fungicidal microbes to help mitigate the impacts of those diseases. And then they might decide to go full rate in block B since it's technically the highest risk with high disease pressure and low biocontrol to help naturally deal um, with the pathogen. So in this, in this last case study, um, a grower is in the process of reducing tillage and integrating cover crops in hopes of improving soil health. They want to assess the impacts of their tillage practice transition by comparing a five-year minimal till, vertical till, whatever you want to call it, to conventionally tilled disc blocks um, to really see if their, their, impact, their uh, management practice changes are having any positive impacts. So first insight we look at comparing that heat map tool again and this time we're looking at those carbon pathways we see a lot more blue in the in the minimal till or vertical till side um, carbon fixation much higher on the disc tillage field we see a lot more yellow um, and this is ultimately you know a lot of those the mycorrhizal one one reason that we're that we focus on mycorrhizal fungi is that they are effective carbon fixers um, so that might be one factor driving this trend which we'll go into look at a little bit deeper in a minute 
And then they pulled B crop plus tests. So they also got um, some information on organic matter percent and CEC. And sure enough, they see that those levels are lower in, in the disc tillage field um, than, the, than the min till. So definitely some positive impacts here on the, on the carbon pathways and organic matter and CEC. Then looking at the microbiome, this is where we can look at essentially the full microbiome from each sample. Um, so this is a, a tool in our portal that we call the, the Microbiome Explorer tool. This is designed to basically resemble a petri dish and each of these circles represents one of the species that was detected in that sample. And then on, when you're on the tool online, you can run your cursor over each of these circles and see the, the species that each of these smaller circles represents um, and their relative abundance. And the size of these circles is relative to their relative abundance and the color is relative, is, uh, indicates what type of species they are, whether they're fungal, bacteria, or archaea. Um, and then down here, up here we have the full microbiome highlighted, so all the species, and down here it's only those mycorrhizal fungi. And sure enough, in the min-till block, we see some mycorrhizal fungi show up at fairly high population levels. In the, till, in the disc block, we see none of them. So that's, that's an example of how we've, we've had growers in the past use this testing to show how their practice changes, have how their soil health has responded to their changes in practice, and they can track these changes over time to further inform and improve their management practices. If things aren't improving, we can discuss what might be going wrong and how we can tweak change, it, tweak the management, um, save a lot of money in the long run, pivoting and and um, producing some positive effects. Or if things are going going positively and we do see changes that we want to see, like in this case study, then it, it gives them some reassurance that what they're doing, what they're investing their money in, is actually helping and, and producing tangible results in the soil um, that should translate ideally into yield results. Um, so that, that concludes my presentation and I don't know if we have time for a couple questions, but um, if there's, there's really one way I like to frame what, what Biomakers was founded to do, um, it's to equip growers with the tools to work with nature and not against it because for you know such a long time we've really viewed nature as something that we need to, to suppress in terms of pathogens and, and work around but as more and more um, information is coming to light through, through experts like Dr. White and others who are illuminating how we can really understand the microbiome in ways that we can uh, we can um, we can integrate changes that that help it work with us and support yield rather than having to go out and, and try to um, essentially mitigate the impacts of nature and try to just get um, put out fertilizer that's there for the plants and pretend like nature isn't isn't there so um, thank you